Good evening, everyone, and welcome to my lecture recital. This lecture recital is in partial fulfillment of the requirements of Doctor of Musical Arts in Conducting. The topic for my lecture today is Enculturation, the role of choral music in re-indigenizing the Nigerian Igbo liturgy. One country, different tones. Nigeria is a mosaic of many ethno-linguistic groups, altogether numbering over 250. Very importantly, this nation came into being not by the amalgamation of all these ethno-linguistic groups, but of two British protectorates, the Northern and the Southern Nigeria. The amalgamation was in some cases a first step in bringing together the different clans of the same ethnic and linguistic group to a sense of a shared identity. In Nigeria, there are three major ethno-linguistic groups, the Hausa, the Igbo, and the Yoruba. Others are referred to as the minority groups, largely due to their population and several other factors, such as socioeconomic placements. Ethnicity has always played a vital role in Nigeria, be it in politics, economy, or resource control. The development of the arts in Nigeria was also along the ethnic distributions of the country, as many of the local arts and crafts are regional. The musical arts of Nigeria were already a recognizable aspect of life within the ethnic distributions of the country. The various ethnic groups had their own distinct musical styles, instruments, and songs. Historically, Traditional Nigerian music arose from a functional purpose. Agriculture was one of such purpose. When northern farmers work on each other's farms, the host was expected to supply musicians. The musician sang praises of his client and the rest of the cooperating farmers to motivate them. The Yorubas traditionally used music for sociocultural expression. Musicians played at all sorts of social and formal events. Popular instruments used by the Yorubas are hourglass tension drums, which is called dundu, and the kettle drums, which is also called gudugudu. In southeastern Nigeria, the Igbos used music for celebration, sports, leisure, and most importantly, to recount stories to others. The Igbo people play various folk instruments such as flutes, which is called oja, xylophones, skin drums called iwa, the metal gong known as alu or ogene, the slit drums, which is known as ekwe, and the shakers, which are ichaka and oyo. And then we also have udu. These instruments played an important role in the development of Igbo high life, which I will discuss momentarily. Religion and music in Nigeria. Another side to Nigeria's multi-ethnic makeup is that it is a country with so many religions. There exist several religions in Nigeria, which helps to accentuate regional and ethnic distributions. Before the advent of the missionary, Nigerians were practitioners of traditional African religion. Historically, it is believed that the earliest practitioners of traditional African religion actually responded to mysteries surrounding them in their various environments. Thus, they felt the need to recognize a supreme being called Chi-Uku or Chuku. He is regarded as the creator of all things. It led them to form religious ideas and beliefs, religious observances, ceremonies, and festivals. All these activities had their accompanying music. Fundamental traditional African belief holds that sound has mystical powers, which can be used to, evolve, to evoke forces of tremendous potency. Conversely, 
the conversion of traditional worshippers to Christianity and Islam has brought about the transference of the same belief in music's metaphysical and spiritual efficacy. Presently in Nigeria, Islam dominates the North and while Christianity dominates the South. In the South of Nigeria, the Southwestern Yoruba part of the country has various forms of Christianity, such as Protestantism and local syncretic Christianity. However, Catholicism and Anglicanism dominates the Igbo southeastern parts and closely related areas. This lecture recital is a survey of the development of Christianity, specifically Catholicism, with an emphasis on the role of choral music in Nigerian Igbo liturgy. A little historical background, colonialism and the missionary. Christianity is one of the two main religions in Nigeria and makes up 48.2% of the population. Nigeria has one of the largest Christian populations in Africa, with over 70 million persons in Nigeria belonging to the church. Between the colonial and missionary history of Nigeria, there is a purposeful attempt by some historians to separate one from the other whereas they are both connected. The missionary strands in the British colonial enterprise in Nigeria are factors that seem to be neglected, but without it, the history of British penetration into Nigeria in particular, and their effective colonial rule in general, may not have been complete. The British missionaries were in Nigeria for the spiritual and moral regeneration of the people, yet, they cooperated with the British government to establish colonial administration in the area. The Christian missionaries' cooperation with the British colonial office for a military conquest of the heathens was considered a basic prerequisite for the effective establishment of Christianity in the colonies. The missionary thus became the spiritual arm of the British imperialism in Nigeria. Apart from the British conquest of Africa, the first Christian contact in Nigeria occurred in the 15th century, when the Portuguese introduced Roman Catholicism. Prince Henry, the navigator of Portugal, desired to sail further into the Atlantic Ocean. His conquest and exploration of Africa can be summarized by his acronym, the three Gs, for God, for gold, and for glory. Henry set out his ships, accompanied by some Roman Catholic missionaries to Nigeria. They visited places like Benin and Wari. And around the riverine areas of Nigeria, the slave trade was already the business of the day. Most of the kings that the missionaries tried to preach to were more interested in the guns that the Portuguese were holding. And for this reason, the planting of Christianity by the Roman Catholic missionaries failed in the 15th and the 16th century. Irrespective of this early failure of the Christian missionary, there were also Protestant missionaries coming to Nigeria. The first Protestant missionary to Nigeria were the Wesleyan Methodists. They began work in the southern part of Nigeria among the Yoruba in 1842. Other Protestant groups followed, such as the Church Missionary Society, CMS, or in Nigerian parlance, we call them CMS. They are also known as the Evangelical Anglicans, whose notable icon of Christianity in the Southwest Nigeria is Bishop Samuel Ajayi Crowder. Nevertheless, Roman Catholic missionaries returned to Nigeria in the 1800s and established the Society of African Missions, also known as the SMA, for the spreading of the Roman Catholic faith which immensely helped in the planting of Christianity in Nigeria. The Society for the Mission of Africa initially attempted to plant Catholicism in Sierra Leone. As you can see, the movement from Sierra Leone to Dahomey. It moved from Sierra Leone to Dahomey, which is now in the Republic of Benin, to plant Roman Catholic faith. However, following a previous visit to Lagos, in 1860, an Italian Roman Catholic priest, Father Boguero, returned to Lagos 
where he met some Catholic indigenous peoples who were freed slaves from Brazil. He also met some Brazilians who were already baptized Catholics and had settled in Lagos. Geographical concentration. The Roman Catholic mission built a chapel in Lagos, now the Holy Cross Cathedral, in 1869 for worshipers of the faith. The church also established a primary school in Lagos the same year. From Lagos, the Roman Catholic faith spread across Nigeria. The faith spread to Asaba and Onicha, thus marking the growth and expansion of Roman Catholic faith toward the Niger Delta areas and Alibu. Alibu means Igbo land. Father, Bishop Joseph Ignatius Shanahan built a mission house in Onitsha and spread the Catholic faith to Ugeli, where he built a primary school, conducted baptism classes, and learned the Igbo language. This is very important because the priest is an Irish priest. He's an Irish man, but he learned the local language of the people. And you will see how it plays out much later in the lecture. His speaking of the language made many Igbo people to be converted to the Catholic faith. By 1924, the Catholic Church in Nigeria was staffed by mostly Igbo natives who are priests. Today, Catholicism is by far the dominant faith among the Igbo people in Nigeria. And music is at the center of all forms of Catholic worship in Alibo. The Roman Catholic influence in Alibo. I'll start with the ordinary of the Mass, the Gregorian chant. Before the Vatican II, the standard music of the Catholic Church is the Gregorian chant, and with the presence of the missionaries, this was equally the case in Ibolan. As Catholic missionaries taught converts the way of the Church, they also taught converts the songs of the Church, especially the ones that were needed at Mass. The first and most popular of these chants were Mass Ordinaries from Missa de Angelis, which is the Mass 9 of the Catholic Kyrialis. The indigenous faithful learned chants by listening and repeating what they heard. The quickest to grasp and memorize the music would end up becoming the music leader or the choir master of the congregation. And then, they moved on to monophonic, uh, monophonic hymn singing. Coincidentally, after the Second Vatican Council, the quest for balance between Catholicism and Igbo culture was all but inevitable. There was a rise in indignation from the faithful due to the language gap created by the use of Latin at Mass. Hence, the concept of Okafada, which means the Mass for the priest alone. This, uh, the composition and introduction of Igbo hymns acted as a solution to the indignation of the faithful. Gifted Igbo Catholic musicians, especially from the clergy, composed songs for the people to sing at Mass. The Mass ordinaries remained in Latin, but other parts of the Mass had songs written rhythmically in the native language, but sung in unison, just as it is with plain chant. This is an example of one of those monophonic songs.
a little bit about social cultural context, early attempts at harmony and music notation. With the spread of Western literacy, educated members of the congregation got involved in the hymn making process. This proved advantageous for the missionaries and it exemplifies one of the first efforts made to combine Christian worship and Igbo culture. Nevertheless, a controversy arose from the translation of church hymns into Nigerian native languages. The problem was due to the tonal nature of Nigerian languages, especially the Igbo language and also the Yoruba language. And this established tonal nature of Nigerian language made it such that when applied to existing European hymns, it loses its meaning. The presence of pre-existing melody of the hymn changes the meaning of the text after it has been translated from English into Igbo and sung with the same melody. For example, a word in Igbo language assumes a totally different meaning when the emphasis is displaced and given to the wrong syllable. On the slide we have um, a hymn which is quite popular in English. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. It's a very popular tune. And when translated into Igbo, it has all hail the power of Jesus translates to Oha, Kele Ike Jesu. But the music, if you apply the music from the English hymn to the Igbo text, you have Oha Kele Ike Jesu. Now, look at the meaning of Oha. You see the tone marks of Lo Hai, which is the second Oha. Oha is a tree or a leaf. Meanwhile, with the correct tone marking, you have Oha, which means all, everybody. Oha and Oha mean two different things. So if you apply the English melody to Oha, Kene, Ike, J, so you look at the first Ike, it goes with high tone marks. EK, which means strength or power. The second one goes high, low, which is EK. Your answer is as good as mine. <laughs> so when you sing, oh, ha, ke, ne, e, ke, Jesu, you're singing something else. You're singing, let the leaves or the trees praise the buttocks of Jesus. <laughs> and of course, that's not what we want to sing when we translate him. So the correct translation would be oh, ha, ke, ne, i, ke, jesu. You can see them marked in the green. Oh, ha, has the G. Ke, ne, i, ke, has the B. I, ke, jesu. These are the musical linguistic issues and considerations that are taken when translating hymns from English to Igbo. And then we move on to harmonic part writing. Despite the issues of tonality and text speech discrepancies in the newly written songs of the church, it didn't stop indigenous composers from writing this way. More so, some of these composers who had been educated in music at the missionary schools built by the missionary started to experiment with the concept of harmony and notation. Considering that church musicians in Igbo land did not have enough exposure to staff notation and that more attention was given to vocal music, church choirs were taught with the use of tonic sulfa notation or what we call in the US as solfage. Tonic sulfa was made popular by John Kerwin and it is used to teach sight singing. The movable dough of tonic sulfur makes it easy for choristers to establish the relationships between tones in a key. As you can see that there are three stages of tonic sulfur scores. The ones written with hand, the ones that are typeset, and most recently the ones that are generated by software. Softwares like uh, Finale and Sibelius. 
These are made for choirs that are basically uh, singing with notation from tonic sulfur. I was trained in this process, and so when we do solfege, it's a little bit of, in my forte. And the last piece right there is my own composition. However, composers at this time still wrote Igbo hymns that had musicolinguistic issues. That is, the sonic displacement of text, pitch, and sound stress. So just to highlight this a bit, I will highlight one of the many musical linguistic issues in the video excerpt we just watched. As you can see, the first text as the starting of the music is which translates to life is filled with worries. And in the spoken text it is but what we have in the music is totally translates into something else, which I cannot interpret. But the correct tonally one would be which is totally different from what the music has. These are some of the musical linguistic issues that plagued music, choral music at the time. However, with the popularization of Western classical music, jazz, and other Western genres towards the late 90s, their influence on liturgical music was equally felt. Newly formed parishes and choirs would buy electric guitars and keyboards rather than install an organ. It didn't stop there. Electric guitars and drum sets were also introduced into the liturgical music. Even without the proper education or the right training on these instruments, church choirs will, uh, will still explore the usage of these uh, Western instruments and try to combine them with African instruments. For a short while, it seemed like it was going to be the trend to combine Western instruments and African instruments in the liturgy. However, with the passage of time, the sonic experience left a little bit more to be desired. sound you've just heard from the video excerpt, it shows that proper training is an important prerequisite for good liturgical music. Because with proper training, there could be proper balancing, and there could be proper singing, and there could be proper accompaniment. But that was not the case in this video, however good and uh, appreciative their efforts were. Now, talking about re-indigenizing or pre-indigenizing the mass with indigenous musical styles. At the turn of the 21st century, globalization and the coming of the internet aided the increase in the level of Western literacy in Nigeria. 
there was a rise in consciousness for excellence in Western music education. The average Catholic chorus that could sing English hymns and Latin chants. Now, here comes the twist. Indigenous composers began to write their own English and Latin hymns with an ethnic Afrocentric pulse. You would hear English music that sounds African. Choir masters took it a step further by playing native style accompaniment to these new hymns, as well as to already existing English hymns of Western origin. This performance practice promoted the localization or the pre-indigenization of hymns by Western composers, irrespective of the fact that English language is the lingua franca of Nigeria. This next video is an example of an indigenous styled accompaniment to an English hymn. Now, with hymns like this, it brought about the need for theological construct. That is, the presence of diocesan and archdiocesan liturgical music commissions. Every Catholic diocese and archdiocese in Nigeria has a music commission that organizes and regulates the liturgical music activities of parish choirs. In the southeastern part of Nigeria, the Onicha Archdiocesan Music Commission is the oldest in existence since its inception in 1970. This music commission worked assiduously to promote the standards of indigenous liturgical songs used for worship within the archdiocese and beyond. For the most part, any of the liturgical music commissions in Igbo land is set up to promote sacred music and with special reference to Igbo liturgical music, coordinate and encourage the efforts of composers and other choir masters, vet and approve all new compositions in Igbo sacred music, arrange new melodies for the parts of the new Ordo Mise in Igbo, not reserved for the celebrants. And finally, to indicate focal areas to talented composers so that their music is not rejected. Talking about text source and interpretation and translation, we can see evidently that with the presence and regulation from the various archdiocesan and diocesan music commissions, the Catholic Church in Igbo land and Nigeria in general Old indigenous compositions are now constantly being reviewed in order to keep up with the theological and dogmatic standards of the church. New compositions are scrutinized for correct adaptation from an appropriate sacred source, proper linguistic interpretation and translation, and most importantly, tonal alignment to the pitch structures of the language. Further steps towards enculturation. Igbo Catholic liturgy has since experienced a surge in the influx of properly guided indigenous compositions with, most, with music education programs in Nigerian universities as well as seminars, workshops, and competitions organized by the music commissions in the Southeast. The level of music literacy has gone further than was previously the case. Catholic liturgy can now therefore be referred to as the people's liturgy talking about mass settings in indigenous languages. Apart from the church's text revision in 2012, most recently, the Catholic Church has revised some of the texts of the mass ordinaries. This has not deterred many Igbo composers who are Catholic from rearranging their previously composed versions.
One very important Nigerian Catholic musician of Igbo extraction is Sir Dr. Jude Nam. He is the most popular Nigerian Catholic composer in recent times, and his contributions to modern Catholic liturgical music in Alibu and in the whole of Nigeria and beyond are immeasurable. He has made liturgical music very simple with his tuneful melodies and catchy rhythms, which are reflective of the Igbo high life genre that is culturally original to him as an Igbo composer. He is one of the earliest Nigerian composers to have written a complete mass setting in Igbo, English, and Latin. This is the Sanctus from his Igbo mass setting. Nigeria. Due to the glamorization of Pentecostalism among the Catholic youths and adults alike, the Catholic Bishops Conference of Nigeria saw it wise to make it a top priority to evangelize the Catholic youth. And the best place to find them is in college campuses and university parishes and chaplaincies. With the university parish and chaplaincies boasting the largest youth numbers the enculturation of liturgical music initiative was targeted to Catholic choirs on Nigerian campuses. And for this purpose, the CBCN formed and recognized, uh, sorry, the CBCN formally recognized and commissioned Film Nigeria. Now, Film Nigeria is the forum for the enculturation of liturgical music, and this body sees to the musical welfare of Catholic choirs in tertiary institutions. Every two years, FILM holds a liturgical music conference in which new indigenous compositions from around the country are produced and premiered. The festival takes the shape of a competition. And so, to better prepare the choirs for this festival, FILM organizes a music seminar one year and then later six months before the competition. One of film's important goals is to promote the conscious and active participation of the Catholic faithful. Musicality, in terms of source, style, and structure. The standard of musicality at film is basically simplicity in creativity. The text source should be theologically rooted in Catholic tradition and dogma while still remaining the authentic linguistic and cultural essence of the catchment area from which the text is drawn. The style should be culturally appropriate to the musical character of the indigenous people, and the structure of the piece should follow one of the indigenous forms of African music and should easily elicit participation from the congregation. This exa an example of this is a performance of the credo 
in Bini language by the chaplaincy choir of the University of Benin. Many Catholic musicians are now proficient in sheet music sight reading because film requires choirs to notate their musical entries in staff notation. If there is also going to be an instrumental accompaniment, which is highly re re uh, recommended, it is expected that that accompaniment is also notated. The requirements for film do not give room for unreasonable improvisation, except it is based on guided stipulations in the score. This promotes performance consistency between different performers towards the same piece. Film Nigeria is not an abstract body from the liturgical music commissions of the various Catholic dioceses and archdioceses in Nigeria. Before any music entry is accepted in film, it must go through a vetting process from the archdiocese and the dioceses from where the university and chaplaincy choirs come from. Invariably, they are all different arms of the same body, working towards the same goal. And every two years, the church is blessed with a plethora of freshly composed musical pieces. Every, 
time we have a film festival like this, it's an opportunity for great things to happen again in the life of the church in Nigeria. Great things, in, by great things I mean in the liturgical life of the church. What we have is a, a, a fresh um, inflow of compositions to facilitate our liturgy, to make our liturgy richer, deeper. Lang uh, compositions in our native languages that we find they used at uh, major celebrations, ordinations, weddings, anniversaries. Indeed, it's been a wonderful journey thus far. All the compositions were original. This is the first time um, anybody had heard these, these pieces, uh, music that were inspired by both the faith tradition of the Catholic Church and also the indigenous music of Nigeria. In conclusion, paving the way of indigenous liturgy in a, in a modern world. Many of the new generation of Catholic composers and choral musicians have been exposed to Western and African musical education in the various university music departments within and outside Nigeria. Presently, choral music in Nigerian liturgy has attained the capacity for appropriate notation and production of sheet music for both vocal and instrumental parts. The, with reference to Igbo liturgy, the use of indigenous styles like high life, which I had mentioned before, and which I will explain very soon, is, is part of the trend. There are some Igbo composers and choral musicians who have introduced neo-fusion and hybrid genres like choral high life. That is, it is called Nkwa in Igbo language, and that is a mix of choral music and traditional Ogene music, or a gong music. Also, some other Igbo composers have combined Igbo high life with genres from other parts of Nigeria to develop new styles, such as Afro high life. With properly guided application, these hybridized choral instrumental styles would go a long way in reshaping the perception of indigenous liturgy because the indigenous liturgical songs will both be religious and African in concept with a contemporary touch of fusion music and will move the congregation in ways never experienced before. They will appeal to the congregation more because their delivery is in the people's language as well as convey some value of gratification which makes them more appreciable and authentic. And finally, the tunes will get the congregation much more involved in the worship and consequently make the worship experience more lively and vibrant. Our feature performance today is the second movement of the Gloria from the Afro High Life Mass by Jude Wankwo. At this point, I would like to invite the performers of this feature piece to come on stage. For the purpose of our feature performance, I will give a brief description of what it is for your understanding. Afro High Life is the fusion of two Nigerian music genres. Afro High Life is a fusion of two Nigerian music genres, Afro Beat and High Life. Afro Beat is a Nigerian music genre that was developed in the late 1960s by Fela Kuti. Afrobeat was influenced by a variety of traditional Yoruba music styles, such as Fuji and Juju, as well as Yoruba vocal traditions and instruments. It further combines the indigenous music styles with American funk, modal jazz, and soul, with a focus on complex intersecting rhythms and percussion. Fela Kuti is responsible for popularizing the style, both within and outside Nigeria. Afro beats with an S should not be confused with Afro beat. The first one is a 21st century sound that is an eclectic combination of genres such as hip hop, house, ndombolo, R&B, and soccer. High life. 
High life is a music genre that started in present day Ghana in the 19th century. It incorporated foreign influences like the Foxtrot and Calypso with Ghanaian rhythms and then gained popularity in the native blues genre before the World War II. After the war, it was adopted by the Igbo people of Nigeria. Taking their own traditional guitar riffs, indigenous percussion, and the influence of the Ghanaian High Life Dance Band, the Igbos mixed and perfected them to form Igbo High Life. This became the country's most popular music genre in the 1960s and has formed the basis of contemporary genres like Afro pop. One of the pioneers of Igbo High Life is Chief Oliver de Kook and Chief Osita Osadebe. Afro High Life Mass by Jude Wampo combines the Afro beat and high life genres with a choral setting of texts from the mass ordinaries. Today's feature performance is the second movement of the mass. Glory to God in the highest.
Keep the way.